want to welcome all of the attendees today. It's uh, particularly great to see current fellows, former fellows, and future fellows uh, dialing in for this, our very first, uh, our inaugural virtual uh, special grand rounds. And I am particularly delighted to welcome our distinguished guest today, Dr. Ashita Talwani. She is a tenured professor of medicine at the University of Alabama, where she also holds the DCI Edwin A. Rutsky Endowed Chair in Nephrology. Um, a particular huge thank you to Dr. Talwani for taking time out of her very busy schedule during this time. Um, Dr. Talwani is a world-renowned expert uh, in acute kidney injury in the ICU as well as in CRRT. She is widely sought after internationally and nationally. She uh, is the founder of the UAB CRRT uh, two-day workshop and she is a, an annual uh, speaker at the board courses. So we are particularly fortunate to have her talk to us today about CRRT uh, in the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just another couple of uh, quick words. I don't have time to go through all of her awards. She is recognized as an exceptional educator. Her CV lists over 40 awards, and I know there are many more to come. So Dr. Talwani, thank you so much, uh, and we're very much looking forward to your presentation today. Thank you so much for that kind, kind, kind introduction. Um, I'm very honored to be here today, and I'm honored to have all these people participate. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and we'll just start. So essentially, what my talk is going to be on is specifically about what we know about CRT and the evidence that stands today, and then I'm going to apply it to what we've learned about our experience with these COVID-19 patients. So here's my disclosure information. Okay, so I'm gonna give a, big, a brief introduction. Um, why CRT for COVID-19? Just a case to get your ideas of what you think the prescription should be. And then we'll talk about specifically CRT prescription and how we can apply it to these COVID patients. And then we'll end with the summary. So just to give you some statistics, um, if you look at essentially what we see at UAB so far, as of 426, we've had some total COVID-19 patients been hospitalized have been about 193. And out of those, about 63% have been discharged. Our hospital mortality has been 12% and our IC mortality 22%. And of course, this is an ongoing everyday assessment. So if you particularly look at our ICU patients, you can see that our demographics are similar to what's been seen all across the United States. Um, our median age has been about 62, need for mechanical ventilation 75%. A predominant of these patients have been male and African American. The predominant comorbidities that we've seen have been hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and smoking. Of those patients in the ICU setting, so far about 29% have required renal replacement therapy, specifically CRRT. We've had nine patients die so far, so our death rate being 32%. We have seen three recover kidney function and four have been discharged home. Of those four, one is still on dialysis and one is an end-stage renal disease patient. And again, we started seeing these patients mid-March, and so this is still more information as time passes, we will get more information. So as you already know, basically with these COVID patients, AKI is common. We're seeing that here, you're seeing that everywhere. The incidence of AKI, depending on whatever geographical study you have read, is about 15 to 25%, but up to 50% in the ICU setting based on the KDGO definition of AKI. And what we're seeing across the United States is that 25 to 30% of these ICU patients will require renal replacement therapy, specifically if they're ventilated. We're noticing the most common indications for us for renal replacement therapy are fluid management and oliguria, and although many of them are on dialysis, we still don't know what the recovery rates are, but this will, we'll find out in due time. So given that, this is a slide that I borrowed from my friend, Michael Connor and Emery. Let's talk about the different mechanisms of AKI in these COVID-19 patients. And there's multiple mechanisms. Um, one mechanism is hypovolemia. These patients can come in with high fevers, nausea, vomiting. 
and GI complaints. We provide aggressive diuresis to protect their lungs, specifically if they already have evidence of ARDS. They definitely get ATN. We've seen this by autopsy reports that have come out from China. Um, essentially, the mechanism for ATN is multifactorial with cytokine storm, severe hypoxic respiratory failure, hypotension. We've seen several cases of rhabdomyolysis, some extremely severe. There's some question whether these patients are hypercoagulable and also in DIC. So could there be microthrombi in the kidney contributing? These patients develop cardiogenic shock, acute pulmonary embolisms, and right ventricular failure in the setting of high PEEP and, of course, uh, pulmonary issues. So you have a low perfusion or venous congestion state. And there's evidence of viral RNA in the kidney, but at this time, it's unclear whether there's direct toxicity from the virus. But regardless, you have multifactorial AKI. So when you look at the guidelines that are now over eight years old, in terms of which dialysis modalities to provide in patients who are dialysis requiring AKI, the KDGO guidelines say use continuous and intermittent therapies as complementary, but they do suggest CRT for hemodynamically unstable patients and those who have elevated intracranial pressure. So where does this data come from? So just in general, we all know what the advantages or indications for CRT are. Clearly, because of its slow parameters, it was made for patients who are hemodynamically unstable in the ICU setting. It provides continuous solute control, which is very important for patients who are hypercatabolic or have ongoing tumor, tumor lysis or rhabdomyolysis. It provides continuous volume control, which is one of the main reasons it's been used for these patients with COVID-19. It is indicated for patients who have increased intracranial pressure. It's also indicated in patients who have AKI who are severely hyponatremic or hypernatremic and need slow correction of their dysnatremias. Because as we know, with intermittent hemodialysis, the lowest sodium concentration we have of our bath is 130. And of course, anyone with high risk of osmotic disequilibrium. But with the indications and advantages, there are significant disadvantages we all need to be aware of. First of all, it requires an ICU level of care. And if you're talking about drug intoxications or severe hyperkalemia, this is not the optimal modality to use. These patients are basically immobilized. Essentially, they require anticoagulation most of the time, and they can get hypothermia. In addition, they essentially, with therapy, can have increased nutritional losses and drug clearance, and it can be costly. And so there's a lot of disadvantages that are also with this therapy. But if you look at some of the advantages or the, the studies, this shows you the reason that KDGO recommended for unstable patients or even for volume overload. On this left side is essentially a graph of a randomized study done by Cleveland Clinic years ago now, a small study comparing patients with intermittent hemodialysis to CRT in the critical care setting of what happens in terms of volume removal and blood pressure issues. And what they have shown that within a 24 hour period that patients on CRT were more successful in getting fluid off due to the hemodynamic stability. In fact, those in the intermittent hemodialysis arm had decreasing mean arterial pressure and required increasing pressure amounts. Similarly, on the right side, this is basically a study done from a prospective observational database of five institutes in the United States that collected data on AKI patients. And they looked at the patient's required renal replacement therapy. And what this showed is that for volume removal, patients who were treated with CRT as depicted by this red line were more successful in having fluid removed than those with intermittent hemodialysis. So there is some data to substantiate the reasons for CRT. What about the intracranial pressure issues? This was a study done by Davenport in cirrhotic patients who had intracranial pressure monitoring. It was a small study, and patients were either placed on intermittent hemodialysis or CRT. And what you can see by this graph here is those on intermittent hemodialysis had elevations of the intracranial pressures. And the reasons for the elevations were due to the fall in serum osmolality or the osmotic shifts caused by intermittent hemodialysis, while you did not see, see the same effect in CRT. So despite these potential benefits and some of the 
uh, indications that I talked about, let's look at studies that have showed outcomes. And again, what we're going to find out, there's no mortality benefit compared to other modalities. There's been multiple meta-analyses now published, and this was one done in 2017. And if you look at this meta-analysis of multiple studies, if you look at those comparing intermittent hemodialysis to CRT, there's no difference in mortality in hospital. Similarly, studies comparing CRT or PERT to CRT, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, no difference in mortality. And if you look at renal recovery, which is also one of the big things that we look at for these patients, essentially whether you use intermittent hemodialysis or PERT therapies like SLED compared to CRT, no difference in recovery. So what about these COVID-19 patients? You know, we've seen a lot of literature where they suggest that CRT is beneficial. Why is that the case? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is these patients have severe ARDS, and what we've been using it for is for extensive volume removal. But the other issues are related to pertinent issues related to the isolation process, and of course, you know, reducing exposure of nursing staff and also PPEs. So CRT machines can provide both CRT and or PERT, most of the machines used today. Uh, most ICU RNs are all trained and competent on the use of CRT, so that doesn't require usually an extra dialysis nurse exposure. These machines that are sequestered in isolation can be used on all patients with standard disinfection techniques, which makes it convenient. And as we know with intermittent hemodialysis, as most centers that requires a dialysis nurse, one-to-one -to, -one to manage and deliver the dialysis. And again, as I already said, that that causes additional exposure of COVID to staff and uh, in the isolation environment. The other thing to pay attention to is intermittent hemodialysis requires sufficient water and drain resources. And depending on where your isolation unit is, this is not always feasible. While CRT, of course, uses commercialized, already produced solutions, so this is not an issue. So let's look at a case. This is a real patient that we saw at UAB, a typical patient. This is a 47-year-old African-American male, has hypertension, coronary artery disease, obstructive sleep apnea, and CKD, also obesity with a BMI of 56, who presented with COVID-19 ARDS and acute kidney injury. We were consulted on day three for worsening AKI. He wasn't responding to diuretics. And when we saw him, he was intubated, sedated, and paralyzed, low tidal volumes, high FiO2 of 100%, PEEP of 20. He was on inhaled EPO, prone position, norepinephrine, along with multiple antibiotics. So these are his labs. Uh, notably, of course, he's hyperkalemic. His ABG, his pH is 7.21. PO2 was 45. Uh, his D-dimers, as we've seen in multiple of these patients, was extremely elevated, including the mass ferritin and CRP. Urinalysis has some blood and, and protein. And so, my question to you as a poll question is, which CRT modality do you place them on? And we'll come back to this question in the end. And, it, and does this differ if it were a non-COVID patient? So your choices are CVVH with pre-filter replacement fluid, CVVH with post-filter replacement fluid, CVVH with both pre and post, CVVHD, and you can go on and on, and H would be any of the above. And I could even add I, I don't know or none of the above. And again, we'll come back to this in the end and I'll give you my thoughts on a COVID patient, how this may be different than a normal answer I would give otherwise. So I'm gonna give a few more, uh, 30 more seconds for the polling. And already what I'm seeing is a lot of different answers, which is great, that's what I want. And of course, the answers will also depend on what your experience has been so far, what equipment you have. And we're going to talk about in the next part of this talk about modalities and how do you make that decision. I think we're getting close to most of the participants answering. I think at this point, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling just for the sake of time.
and share the results. And what you can see, there's a big distribution, but the majority are picking CVVHDF with pre and post filter replacement fluid. So we're going to come back to this and see if these answers change and then I will give you my assessment of my thoughts with this patient. All right, so now let's see if your answer changes by actually looking at the technical questions for CRT. So now let's focus on the critical elements of the CRT prescription. Modality, dose, and if we get time, anticoagulation. So let's start with modality. So as all of you are aware, CRT is an umbrella of different types of therapies that usually use convection or diffusion or a combination of both to remove solutes. So the top picture here depicts convection. And in convection, you have a hydrostatic pressure placed across the filter, and essentially plasma water is pulled or dragged through that filter at such a high rate that it drags solutes. And the rate limiting factor as to the size of the solutes that are removed through the filter is the size of the CRT pore size of the filter itself. And for most CRT filters, that's about 30,000 Daltons. And essentially with convective therapies, because you're removing a high volume of plasma water, you have to replace the volume and electrolytes back to the patient. Now, the bottom side of this picture shows you diffusion. In contrast to convection, diffusion is where a dialysate runs countercurrent to the blood across a semi-permeable membrane, and solutes remove from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. And essentially, it's time dependent. So large molecules don't have time by Brownian motion to move all the way across. So diffusion is mostly a therapy for small molecules less than 1,000 Daltons. So you can see here, in terms of convection versus diffusion, again, diffusive clearance good for probably over or, or molecules less than 1,000 Daltons, and convective clearance up to 15 to 20,000 Daltons typically on a typical CRT circuit. And to give you an idea of what this represents, most of the molecules that we are talking about for electrolytes are under 1,000 Daltons. And these middle molecules or that potentially can be removed through convection are these inflammatory mediators, which we'll get through later. So these are your CRT therapies. I'm not going to focus on SCUF, which is slow continuous ultrafiltration and just used for fluid removal. But I'm going to focus on these three other modalities in terms of how solutes are removed. So CVVH stands for continual venous venous hemofiltration and it uses pure convection. So you have a hydrostatic pressure placed across the membrane, plasma water is dragged or pulled through that membrane at a high rate, and the amount of fluid and the electrolytes are replaced back by what's called a replacement or dilutional fluid. And this fluid can be either given prior to the filter or after the filter. So your operative fluid is a replacement fluid. CVVHD is continuous venomenous hemodialysis, and it's just like it sounds, it uses diffusion which is a dialysate electrolyte solution that runs countercurrent, and again, solutes are removed by diffusion or a concentration gradient. CVVHDF, continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, uses both. So you have a dialysate, you have concentrations uh, or solutes removed by a concentration gradient, and you also are placing a hydrostatic pressure across the filter and moving plasma water at a high rate, so you have replacement fluid where you can replace it either pre or post. Okay, so in order to understand the difference in terms of the technical aspects of the modality, we have to talk about some math and how you calculate clearance. And luckily with CRT, it's really easy. So your generic clearance formula is mass removal rate over the blood concentration. And this basically becomes your fluent flow rate times your fluent concentration over your blood concentration. We all have seen the formula U times V over P, and this is exactly what it is. So it can be mathematically depicted by this formula. And if you look at the affluent definition, essentially for convective therapy, CVVH, it's your total ultrafiltration rate. Everything that comes out into that affluent bag, which is your replacement fluid plus your fluid removal. For CVVHD, is your spent dialysate and whatever additional ultrafiltration you're using for fluid removal. And for CVVHDF, it's a combination of both. So if you're looking at solute clearance, since urea is typically the solute we look at in terms of outcomes, the effluent rate is much lower than the blood flow rate for CRT, which in hemodialysis is opposite. 
Because of this, though, over time, 72 hours, equilibrium can be reached for small molecules. So the effluent basically concentration equals your blood concentration. This ratio is known as the seeding co coefficient. And as I already mentioned, for small molecules like urea clearance, this becomes urea and creatinine, this becomes one. So your clearance is essentially equivalent to your fluent rate. Very simple. The more solutes you want to remove, the more buffer you want to provide to the patient, the higher the effluent rate. You do this by increasing your replacement fluid, your dialysate, your fluid removal. That is how you increase solute removal or provider of more electrolytes through CRT. The way we express dose though with CRT is in milliliters per kilogram per hour. So just to give you a perspective of how this compares to our routine KT or V, for CRT, most of us use a dose between 20 and 35 liters per kilogram per hour. And if you assume the volume of distribution is 0.6 liters per kilo, you can see what the equivalent KT or V is. So now let's talk about how solute clearance differs with the different modalities. So with CVVH, we all know that's convective clearance and you provide replacement fluid pre or post, and or it can be split into both pre or post. And the question is, what makes you decide this? The bottom line is, let's take an example of a patient who's on CVVH or post-filter replacement fluid. So what's happening in this situation is my total UF is 1.5 liters per hour, and I'm replacing that amount in back in electrolyte solution. So my dose, this will be my total effluent rate, would be this divided by the patient's weight, which is 21. But what happens is as I pull plasma water through this circuit, it's going to cause increased viscosity and concentration of hemoglobin and proteins in the blood. And basically this leads to, everyone knows, clotting. So the proportion of plasma volume that is removed with the circuit is called filtration fraction, which is basically can be interpreted as an indication of when the circuit's gonna clot. So it, it's represented by the total ultrafiltration amount, whatever's pulled through the filter, which is not dialysate, over your plasma flow rate, okay? Plasma flow rate being one minus the hemoglobin. And so filter clotting has been associated with this filtration fraction greater than 25%. So in this case, you have 1,500. Your blood flow, converting it into milliliters per hour is 6,000 times one minus hematocrit, that's plasma flow. So this circuit will likely clot. So basically what we do instead is provide some of that post-filter fluid or all of it pre-filter. By doing this, we dilute the blood that goes into the circuit so you have less issues of clotting, but you also dilute the electrolytes and the solutes going into the circuit. And therefore you reduce your efficiency of solute removal. And it's not so important to know the formulas, but this is essentially what you're diluting it back is what the you're adding to the plasma, the replacement fluid. And so your actual delivered dose is gonna be your fluent rate times this dilution factor. So if we take the same patient, instead of giving the replacement fluid post filter, we're giving it pre, and of course the plasma water has been removed at 1.5 liters per hour. Now you can see by using the dilution factor, your dose is 16 milliliters per kilogram per hour versus the 21 we saw in the previous example. This is a 24% de decrease compared to post-dilution. However, if you use, look at the filtration fraction, since that plasma water, which is the bottom in the denominator, we're adding the, repla the replacement fluid or diluting it, you can see what happens to the filtration fraction, it decreases. So, Another way, by the way, of decreasing the filtration fraction, besides giving the fluid pre-filter, is increasing the blood flow, which is in the denominator. But you can see that giving pre-filter definitely helps the filtration fraction, but you lose efficiency. And I like this table because it can show you exactly how much that efficiency is lost based on your blood flow. So if you want to provide someone a dose of 35 milliliters per kilogram per hour post-filter, but you want to give that same dose pre-filter, and you have a blood flow of 100, and let's say your patient's 100 kilos, that requires more than 12 liters an hour pre-filter to provide that same dose, which normally would be 3.5 liters an hour post-filter. So when you're 
giving pre-filter fluid, you have to keep this in mind and use higher blood flows. So in summary, when you're using post-dilution, you're reinfusing it into the venous line. The disadvantage is your ultrafiltration rate is limited by the filtration fraction, but your dose is directly related to the UF rate. For pre-dilution, yes, it, the advantage is it prolongs the circuit life by decreasing filtration fraction, but it also reduces your efficiency and reduction of your solutes. If you look at both therapies, this is probably the biggest summary slide that I want you to, to be aware of. Whether you use convective or diffusive clearance, the bottom line is this, for the same effluent rate, for small molecules, the clearance is the same. It's directly proportional, okay? So for CVVH clearance, your CVVHD clearance for small molecules is the same, as long as you're using post-filter replacement fluid for the same rates of effluent. However, the big difference comes with the convective therapy. This represents middle molecules. And you can see with convective therapy, there's much better clearance with CVVH versus CVVHD. Now, I must say this linear relationship doesn't always hold. So there is a limit to the higher the effluent rate where the blood flow does make a difference and this starts basically flattening. And we'll talk about that in the summary slide. So in general, summing up everything that I've said, if you are using a diffusion-based therapy, your blood flow should be 2.5 times the dialysate flow to ensure that you have that linear relationship with solute clearance with diffusion. That's what I was alluding to just now. For post-filter CBVH, your blood flow should be five times your replacement fluid, and that typically keeps your filtration fraction less than 25%. And for pre-filter CBVH, your blood flow should be six times replacement fluid to optimize, basically, to make sure your efficiency is not decreased. Okay, so that's where these numbers, if you've seen them come from, it's from the tables and charts I showed before. All right. Now, now that you know the difference in the modalities and the technical aspects, what are you going to choose? Well, this depends on your CRT device, whether you believe in convective versus diffusive therapy, and on the technical aspects we talked about. So in general, these are the CRT machines that you can use in the United States. So the biggest issues are with next stage, you can either do CVVH or CVVHD. So that decides your therapy. With both the Prismax and Prismaflex, you can do all therapies, CVVH, CVVHD, and CVVHDF. And with the Tableau machine, which is a home hemo machine and, an, and a PERT intermittent dialysis machine, you can only do CVVHD. So sometimes that dictates your therapy. Also, there may be issues related to the machine that, are, that also can affect how you deliver your therapy. For instance, with the Prismaflex, they have this duration chamber which prevents air from coming back to the patient. And essentially, it, it's, it provides a vortex and you have air and blood in the chamber and if they combine together, they clot. So for Prismaflex, it's recommended that you use a minimum of 200 to 500 milliliters of post-filter replacement fluid to prevent clotting of that chamber. So that itself can dictate what other therapies you can do. Now, what about this controversy? Is convective therapies better than diffusive therapy? Well, if you look at the evidence-based medicine, the answer would be no. This is a meta-analysis comparing hemofiltration to hemodialysis, of which there was 19 randomized controlled trials and 16 used CRT, and there was no difference in outcomes in terms of mortality. Yes, the convective therapies did reduce cytokine levels, but they also were associated with more clotting of the filter because of protein layering occurring as you're using high plasma flow rates. So what are the considerations with your COVID-19 patients? Well, all of us know that when we're prescribing these patients you know, with, with modalities and therapies, we want to limit nursing exposure and use of PPEs. So it's really important important when you design your prescription for these patients, you think about things that will decrease manipulations of the device, i.e. bag changes. Use the simplest protocol. Don't use a protocol that requires five different bags that will need to be changed at different times. These are the things to think about. Make sure that your access is good, that your 
anticoagulation is good to diminish alarms that are occurring. So those are the kind of considerations that may differ from someone else who you don't have that, you don't have to have that or deal with this. The other issue is some of us, like we have done, use extension tubing with the CRT devices. So the machines are outside the rooms, therefore this minimizes nursing having to go back into the room to change bags and also protects or prevents the use of extra PPEs. But as we all know in these patients, and we'll talk about this later in the next you know, five minutes, the risk of circuit clotting is much higher. So you have to have a proper access placement in these patients. And I would say that if you're using CVVH, there's so much clotting with these patients, specifically with the cytokine storm and inflammatory markers, you would really need to use higher blood flow rates and pre-filter fluid to optimize that clotting issue and decrease the filtration fraction. But I would say that preferably, and this is based on my opinion, diffusion-based therapies would probably be better for these patients, just seeing the amount of clotting we are seeing. So just to give you an example of the extension tubing, which in itself can have some negative aspects too, which I will go over. We figured out that we can use what's called uh, level one trauma uh, tubing to add to the length of our, from our access to our, our CRT device. So essentially we take the bottom of this tubing, two sets for one patient. This is all the tubing, it's about four to five feet. And this is what we've done in, all, in our unit. You can see that the machines are outside the rooms and essentially the long tubing allows the patient to be in the room. And if you look down our ICU hall, you can see multiple CRT machines lined up outside the rooms. The downside is yes, there is increased clotting with the extensions. Two, your access pressure alarms cannot easily be detected if there's a, if there's a disconnect. And so patients can potentially lose blood if it's not caught. And three, this causes more hypone uh, hypothermia. So for us, all our nursing stations are right next to the machine. So that allows the nurse, since they're outside the rooms, to have better uh, exposure to the CRT machine to notice any issues. Plus, we have noticed if we put bear huggers around the extensions, then we have no more problems with hypothermia. Okay? So now let's talk about dose. So there's many studies looking at whether a higher dose of therapy portends a better outcome, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna just focus on the largest studies. There was the ATN trial, which looked at a strategy of less intensive dosing, one part was CRT versus higher dosing. In the CRT arm, the, the less intense dosing was a fluent rate of 20 milliliters per kilogram per hour compared to 35. And the New Zealand trial was a purely CVVHDF trial looking at a dose of 25 milliliters per kilogram per hour compared to 40 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Bottom line is none of these studies showed that a higher dose pretends a better outcome. So what we know now is that an affluent flow rate for CRT of at least 20 to 20, at least 20 to 20 five milliliters per kilogram per hour is efficient, ensuring that you're delivering that, i.e. paying attention to pre-dilutional fluid and time on the machine. In most of these studies, patients were on CRT over 20 hours a day. So guidelines, not evidence-based, suggest maybe using a slightly higher dose to take into account for time off the machine. So what about high volume hemofiltration? And this becomes very relevant when it comes to these COVID patients who have cytokines all flying all over the place. Let's look at the evidence. This was a meta-analysis of four trials, small studies, looking at high volume hemofiltration, which is an affluent rate with convective therapy greater than 50 milliliters per kilogram per hour compared to what was considered standard. So this is a high arm, this is standard, and just for sake of time, the bottom line, there was no difference in renal recovery, no reduction in vasopressor requirements, no mortality reduction with high volume hemofiltration. Since then, there's been two more other, there are two more trials looking at the same aspect. This was a trial where patients with post-cardiac surgery who were on severe shock with pressors were either randomized to high volume hemofiltration or standard care, meaning standard care, meaning the application of CVVHD when they developed AKI. And again, this showed no difference in mortality. The high volume hemofiltration had faster correction of metabolic acidosis and came off pressors faster 
but also had other complications like hypophosphatemia, metabolic alkalosis, and thrombocytopenia. Finally, this was a study looking at septic patients using CVVHDF and high dose CVVHDF. So a dose of 80 milliliters per kilogram per hour compared to 40. And not surprisingly, in this randomized studies, granted all these studies are pretty much low numbers of patients, there was no difference in outcomes. However, the high dose arm did show significant reduced levels of cytokines or you know, interleukin-6, 8, et cetera. So what about these COVID patients? Because this comes up all the time. Do we need an increased dose for these patients? No, you should not go beyond the traditional dosing unless you need it for metabolic issues or other pertinent issues like acid base. There is no data for convective clearance for removal of cytokines. And even though that sounds exciting in these patients, just realize if you're gonna use high convective therapy, you're going to get substantially much more clotting and eventually your patients are not gonna get any therapy at all. And now that we're experiencing shortage of CRT solutions across the United States, I don't know if that's happened with you, I would argue that you need to conserve solutions even more and that you should try to use the lowest rate achievable to still control acid base and hyperkalemia, which are the main issues that we are experiencing. So even doses less than 20 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So that's my assessment or thoughts on dose in in COVID patients. And we can talk about some of these filters later on in the discussion. Finally, the last few minutes, I wanna talk about anticoagulation. And I'm gonna go through this uh, rapidly because I really wanna to get to the aspect of the COVID patient. So just remember, when you prescribe a therapy, what you deliver is never the same amount. In fact, some studies have showed a 68% uh, of what you prescribe is delivered. And a lot of this has to do with time off the machine from clotting. So we already talked about some of the factors contributing, filtration fraction, issues with the duration chamber. But I will argue that one of the most important factors is ensuring a great vascular access and then of course anticoagulation. So it is very, very important. The best access is in the right IJ and should be at the right atrium at the atrial cable junction, okay? If you're doing a femoral catheter, it needs to be at least 24 centimeters and located in the IVC. What we're noticing with these COVID patients is that essentially we're doing proning every day and these patients are getting moved around a lot. And with that, it's very easy for the access to get malpositioned. But in the same setting, we're not getting as much x-rays to minimize, of course, exposure and PPEs. So it's very important that you get an access place. And if you start having clotting when you normally did not, you need to reassess whether that line is in the right position. And it's very important specifically in this patient population that's already having issues with circuit clotting. Now, in general, Looking at the KDGO guidelines, all this big slide says they recommend citrate. Now, citrate is off-label. It's not FDA-approved in the United States, so I just need to make sure you're aware of that. But why citrate? There's been multiple randomized controlled trials. This is a meta-analysis of 11 randomized controlled trials of almost 1,000 patients that show that it's better filter patency and less bleeding. There recently was a large trial comparing regional citrate anticoagulation to heparin out of Europe of over 600 patients, which also has shown better filter patency will be coming out soon. So citrate has evidence of being superior. The way it works is it chelates calcium and calcium is required for every step of the coagulation cascade. So essentially citrate is provided prior to the connection of the patient to the circuit. And essentially, the, it chelates the calcium in the blood of the circuit. You can measure that effect by the ionized calcium in the circuit, and you reverse that effect by providing a calcium infusion. Citrate and calcium combined form total calcium. So the citrate, most commonly the formulations used, is converted to bicarb. And if you have a working liver, one mole of citrate potentially converts to three moles of bicarb. And so essentially, it is also a buffer. Now, we are concerned about the metabolic consequences. If you give too much citrate, of course, you get metabolic alkalosis. 
But the biggest concern is when citrate's not metabolized and it's sitting in the blood chelating calcium. And in that situation, you can get a worsening metabolic acidosis. Since citrate is not approved as a solution in the United States, the solutions that everyone is using is either ACDA or 4% trisodium citrate which have high concentrations of sodium. And so this can also affect what type of CRT solutions you're using. And since citrate chelates calcium, you have issues with calcium homeostasis and also chelates magnesium. So when you're talking about citrate toxicity, the biggest concern of course is when citrate's not metabolized. And this is in situations where you have shock liver or high lactic acidosis. And essentially what happens is that citrate and calcium the citrate continues to chelate the calcium in the blood. So therefore your ionized calcium in the blood goes down requiring escalating infusions of calcium. Then since the citrate sits as an anion combined to calcium, it causes a worsening anion gap acidosis. And the citrate is chelated to calcium. So your total calcium level compared to your ionized calcium level increases and that ratio becomes more than 2.5 to one. So this is what you see, it's called a calcium get gap. Normal total calcium to ionized calcium ratio is about 50%, but if the calcium citrate's not getting bound, or excuse me, metabolized, it increases. And the concern is not that citrate itself is toxic, it's the effect of the ionized calcium, because most protocols measure ionized calcium to every six hours. And if you have no reserve, with the liver not working, or significant lactic acidosis greater than eight, your ionized calcium in the blood can fall profoundly before it's detected and cause hypotension, arrhythmias, and death. So what about the COVID patient? There's multiple reasons I can have a whole nother talk about why they have increased circuit clotting. We do know that they have a cytokine storm and inflammation which coats the membrane. They're also hypercoagulable. So some of this they say is because of the DIC, but there are other studies that have looked at this and actually they ha seem to have a hypercoagulable state. Of course, if you're using extension lines, this will increase circuit clotting, improper dialysis access. And then what we've noticed, we're using very high fluid removal rates for some of these patients, 300, 400 cc's an hour. So you have higher filtration fractions and most of these patients have preserved hemoglobins, which increases your filtration fraction too. So these are all the issues. And this is a picture of what we've seen coating our membranes and tubing of these CRT patients who are hyperinflamed with high D-dimers and high inflammatory markers. So it has become known all over the United States that you need anticoagulation. And what we've noticed is in these hypercoagulable patients who are inflamed, RCA is not effective. Even heparin in high doses is not effective. So you can use argatroban and bivalrudin as alternatives. And I've given uh, here how argatroban can be used and what you are uh, aiming for in terms of therapeutic PTT. But what we've noticed and finally discovered after trial and error that works the best out of all those, even the thrombin inhibitors, is using both regional anticoagulation and heparin. And we've now done it in over 20 patients and been successful. And what we're targeting is the circuit ionized calcium to be less than 0.35, and we're using a heparin infusion rate targeting a goal of 50 to 70, or an anti-10A level 0.28 to 0.5. And with this, we've been successful, and probably because the citrate helps with the inflammatory deposits on the filter, which we know citrate can do, and the heparin with the hypercoagulable state. And now I know several other centers who are using the same combination and reporting excellent results. So in summary, um, if you look at CRT in general, there's no overall benefit of CRT compared to other modalities but it is considered to be better by some evidence I presented for those with hemodynamic instability or volume overload or increased ICP. And at this point, I cannot tell you there's a true benefit for convective therapies versus diffusive. There's no benefit for intensive dose, but you need to still be aware of what dose and provide the minimal that's accepted. And look at other parameters to target dose, including acid base and potassium Finally, anticoagulation citrate for most patients that are not COVID positive, 
is still the preferred anticoagulant. So I wanna go back to this patient for my last two minutes, and then we can take questions. You remember this is our typical um, obese, hypercoagulable, inflamed uh, patient who's on basically has ARDS and severe AKI requiring CRT. I would like to see now by your polling whether your answer changes by my presentation today. And a majority of you last time, I think 23% or 26% had picked G. So let's see if we can share that poll one more time. I'll give another 10 seconds for the sake of time since um, I'm seeing a majority answering. Okay. I'm gonna end the poll again, just for sake of time and share the results. And what I've noticed, there is definitely a change um, in terms of what was at first of this presentation. And I would have to agree with some of the options. I think from my perspective, if this was not a COVID patient, that any of those modalities would be appropriate now knowing the limitations and being able to control for those limitations. But I would probably argue for a COVID patient, seeing the amount of plotting we're having and difficulty keeping circuits running, and keep in mind, people are now running out of filters and tubing, that essentially you can't really afford to have clotting and loss of tubing and filters. So probably I would stay away from convective therapies and specifically B, which I think seeing what you, all of the results now, most of you agree with. I think with the other therapies, and again, it depends on what you choose or what kind of device you have, but I would keep in mind, again, you know, the aspect of if you're using CVVHDF with pre and post filter, you're talking about three different solutions that need to be changed. And if you have machines outside the room, that is fine, but keep in mind what, if you are not able to do that, what the nursing aspects need to, will, will be like too, and protect them also. So my feeling would be I would favor using the diffusive therapies more. I would probably, at my own institution, um, stay away from convective therapies just because of the risk of increased clotting and loss of filters. But that's my opinion base, been my experience so far. So I hope that this was somewhat helpful for you. Um, it's hard to fit all this in, in the, in the time frame. So if I didn't touch on any area, please, please, please feel free to email me. And at this time, I'm happy for someone to tell me what the, the, the chat questions are and take any questions. And thank you again for your patience and, and being with me on this Wednesday afternoon. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tawani. Uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions uh, now. We've had some come in the chat box. Um, Dr. Tawani, I don't know if you could see them in the chat. Um, okay, let's see. All right. Um, okay, here we go. Let me see what I see. So first question, and a very good question, is literature from China has suggested IL-6 mediated cytokine storm in COVID-19. Yes, that is true. And meta-analysis have shown better IL-6 clearance with CVVH and CVVHD. So what are my thoughts about predominantly convection and using regional anticoagulation to mitigate filter clotting? Um, I understand that IL-6 did not improve mortality in previous studies, but currently trials are underway. Looking at IL-6 antagonists, uh, when I, patients are already on RRT, I feel it makes sense to try CVVH or CVHDF with higher convection to see that improves outcomes since both modalities are standard of care. Please let me know your thoughts. So I agree with you. Um, the issue though is even though that you can remove IL-6, as you pointed out nicely, that we really don't know if that improves outcomes. Um, for me, you know, the experience that I have, if you can use convective therapy even if you use regional anticoagulations, it's not been effective. But if you can use convective therapy, use higher blood flows, pre-filter, and get away from the aspects of significant clotting, then of course, you know, you have nothing to lose and potentially some benefit that we don't know at this point. The biggest issue though is I've not seen many places that have been able to do that effectively. And my concern is if you read all across the country is, you know, we're even experiencing this and saying, showing that a you know, we don't have filters anymore, we don't have tubing, so you have to be very cognizant that you can't really afford to have continuous clotting. Now, that being said, FDA has approved some of these cytokine-removing filters, like Oxiris, 
which is a filter that can be used as a dialysis filter with CRT, which mainly is for endotoxins, but has also been shown to remove IL-6, and also the cytosorb, uh, which again is FDA approved and supposed to remove uh, inflammatory mediators. Now the Exiris, the mechanism by what, how that moves of cytokines is because it's an AN69 filter, like an AN69 filter's absorption. So if you're using CRT, potentially using some AN69 filters can help with this. But keep in mind, when you're talking about these kind of therapies with convective clearance, the protein layering occurs very fast on that filter. So to be really effective for trying to remove cytokines, which we don't know if it improves mortality, you will be having to change those filters out quite frequently, at least every 12 hours. And so it's always a risk versus benefit about the resources you have and what's available in the United States in terms of um, filters, et cetera. So I hope that answers the question. Um, I don't know whether it improves outcomes, but I'm just giving you some of the issues with trying to do it in this kind of scenario we have. So those are my thoughts. Um, this is not related to today's topic, but could you please comment on the dose needed to clear ammonia? Oh my goodness. Another controversial issue. Um, so ammonia can be removed by CRT. It's a small molecule, just like lactate. But it, is, it depends on the patient population generation. If you have someone with a urea cycle defect and you stop that defect, um, then of course ammonia can be removed. With patients with cirrhosis and on continuing generation of ammonia, um, it's a little bit more controversial. We will do it, but typically you would have to use rates as high as over 40 milliliters per kilogram per hour if you look at the literature. And there's also a lot of other mechanisms, ammonia removal that still occurs. So I think the jury is out, but if you're going to do it, that is uh, probably what I would recommend. Now keep in mind, that we've tried dialysis and other therapies for ammonium removal for years and not shown any change in outcome. And that's why therapies such as the MARS therapy were created. So even though you can remove ammonia, especially in these uh, liver patients, again, it's not sure if it really makes a difference. Okay, so next question, when do you start combined anticoagulation therapy? All of them. I used to trial it out. And these patients were clotting every two hours. And then when I realized that we may get into a situation where our filters and our tubing are not available, because already our filters that we use were, were not able to get, I decided that the safest thing to do to preserve filters, et cetera. And also these patients, when they clot, they're, they're time off the machine, so they're not getting fluid removal, et cetera, is that any patient that we have with COVID, we immediately start on systemic heparin and citrate. Every time we've tried not to do that, it's not been successful. Okay, do I look for evidence of hypercoagulability? Um, you know, we can, we do, we get D-dimers, et cetera, but not consistently. And I'm going to be looking at the data for that. But currently our policy is to treat all those patients unless they have a contraindication to systemic anticoagulation. And even patients on ECMO, um, we are advising not to do CRT through the circuit because they will clot and we need a separate circuit to be able to provide uh, systemic and regional anticoagulation. And that's been our experience so far. So I hope those were somewhat reasonable answers to those excellent questions that were very difficult. <laughs> So I think that's uh, all we have time for, and I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. Uh, there were some questions that we weren't able to get to. Um, I will uh, pass those along to Dr. Tolani and, and have her uh, follow up. Um, we'll, so thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your time and attention today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about future webinars, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at NU Nephrology, or you can sign up for our email list uh, by visiting our website, uh, nephrohub.org. Um, there you can also find resources, um, other resources and events. Uh, and keep an eye out on your email for our webinar recording and a short survey um, to help us build future uh, webinars like this. And thanks again uh, for joining us. And uh, we hope you all are well and stay safe. And we can't wait till we get to see you the next time online or in person. Thanks. Okay.
Thank you. And I'm available to answer any questions by email. So feel free to email me anytime. But thank you so much, everybody. I really enjoyed it.